the church. Behold your beauty, all oh, your splendor, always filled with awe and wonder. Oh, we praise your name. Oh, we praise your name today. Yes, give me praise. We give you praise, Jesus. Good morning, church. How y'all feeling today? Amen. Listen, when I think about Easter Sunday, when I think about what some of us call Resurrection Sunday, two words come to mind, and those words are access and anticipation. Access because our Savior died with open arms to receive us to receive the sin that we were supposed to carry, he carried it, and we're embraced by him. Access because when they laid him in the tomb, they closed it with a rock. But soon later, three days after that, the stone was rolled away, and we had access to a risen Savior. The wounds in his wrists and his feet open wounds meaning access representing the access that we have to his glory and the anticipation that comes after the access it's not just to come into the presence of God and that's just it there's a, there's a work that happens we anticipate the glory that transforms us Mary ran to the tomb to see Jesus and she was met with the glory of angels telling her the Savior isn't here anymore. You now have access and you can anticipate to see him again. We have that anticipation today. And so we rest in that truth knowing that he is alive and that we know that the glory that rose from the grave is the glory that lives in us now. And a part of this song that we're about to sing says, the fullness of God won't be kept in a grave it is so massive so big sometimes overwhelming but you know what that does not stop us from filling the fullness of God inside of us being filled with his fullness so would you join us in worship now to be filled with the fullness of God that no longer remains in the grave amen
Your name is the highest. Your name is the highest. Yeah, yeah. No enemy can hold you down. Cause there's nobody in the grave now. One head gets to wear that crown. Cause there's no sing it out, church. No enemy can no nobody one head. Hey. Cause there's nobody in the grave now. No enemy can hold you down. No, cause there's nobody in the grave now. One head gets to wear hey. Cause Praise your name, Jesus. We lift you high, God. You are good. You reign forever.
sacrifice for us, God, and thank you so much for your love for us. We praise you today, God. We give you all the praise you deserve. You are worthy of it all. And it's in your name. We give you thanks and praise and say it all in your name. Amen. 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 It's so good to worship together. It's so good to be here today. We just want to give you a minute to greet someone around you in this moment. Well, good morning, OKC community. Happy Easter. Come on. Man, it Happy is. Happy Easter in the balcony, too. Hey, there's, Come yeah. On. Happy Easter in the balcony. We don't give the balcony enough love. You guys are looking great. Hey, thank you so much for being here. Happy Easter. We're so glad you are here today. Uh, my name is Isaiah. This is Scott. We're a couple of the pastors here, and we just want to say welcome. Um, we just, uh, we're so glad you're here. And hey, if you're new, uh, we know we have some new people today visiting us on Easter. We're so honored that you would spend your Easter with us. And so we just want to say welcome. We hope you felt welcomed and loved today. And we would love to meet you. Um, if you have a chance after the service, visit us at the, uh, at the New Here booth out there. We'd love to get to know you, get to know a little bit about you, um, and just say hello. So again, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, and if you're new here within the past year, or maybe you've never had a chance to come to Next Step, we have a Next Step happening in two weeks from today. Let me tell you about Next Step. Okay, Next Step is an opportunity to the staff, some key leaders will be there. We have a free lunch. Come on, who doesn't like free? And uh, when you come, hey, we share a story, some of the things we're passionate about, but also you get to learn about all the different ways to connect here at OKC Community. And we really love that opportunity to get to know you better, to get to know your family better. And so best way to sign up, there's a table out in the lobby. You'll see it around the corner to the right. And uh, just sign up there at the next step table. Yeah, and if you've been with us this year, you know that at the beginning of each month, we're doing something really special this year called First Wednesdays. Yeah. Come on. If you, the people who are chilling, cheering or people who have been to First Wednesday, uh, <laughs> it is great. It is such a great way to center yourself, focus your heart at the beginning of each month. And so our next First Wednesday is coming up right away on April 3rd. And we are actually super excited about this one. We want you to put it on your calendar, make plans to be there this Wednesday, because as a family, we're going to be celebrating baptism oh, oh. at First Wednesday. So Scott, tell us uh, if someone in the room is looking to get baptized or has questions, what should they do? Well, first of all, we've got two opportunities this week. We First Wednesday on Wednesday or Sunday. So if one works better than the other, you have two opportunities. And let me tell you just a little bit about baptism. Baptism itself, when you give your life to Christ, there's an inner working that happens. That is your salvation. But getting baptized is that outer 
It's the way that you can proclaim Christ to everybody around you. It is such an impactful moment in a life. I remember mine. Do you remember yours? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, hey, we just want to invite you. Uh, there, once again, same table. There's a baptism table out in the lobby. And if you're interested or you've never been baptized, if you even just have questions, stop by there, put your name down. I'll reach out to you probably this afternoon because we got moved quick, all right? And uh, we would love to have you and celebrate that huge moment in the life of a Christian. Yeah, we would love to help you make that next step. And again, as a family, this next Wednesday and next Sunday, we want to be there to celebrate with those people as well. So make plans to be there with us. Um, also, if you are someone who would say that you are maybe new in your faith, like you've given your life to Christ recently, um, or maybe it was a while ago, but you still feel a little unsteady, we're starting a new thing uh, towards the end of April called Fresh Faith. It's right there on the screen. It's a series of sessions for new believers and we are so excited about this to help you take your next step in your faith. Um, and so we're going to be talking about it more in April, but it's on April 21st. Um, again, if you're someone who is new in your faith, we would love for you to join us. Again, visit the table out in the lobby for a little bit more information and to sign up. And once again, free lunch. There you go. Come on. I'm all about the free lunch if you haven't noticed, right? We will feed right? you anytime okay. you come an extra time. It's great. Hey. Uh, if you're here this morning, you're wanting to give of your tithes and offerings, first of all, um, thank you. Thank you so much for being faithful. There's a lot of different ways you can do that. Uh, giving is really at the heart of all that we do. And on a day like today, when we are giving thanks for all that God has done for us, for Jesus going to the cross, but it never stopped there. His provision for us through the years of taking care of us has always been there. And giving is just the way that we can say thank you in a way that we can be faithful in response. And so if you're wanting to do that, there's a lot of different ways. We have joy boxes in the back, the old envelope, come on. And uh, if you, you can do it online, you can do it through our app as well. And uh, we'd be honored if you would join us together as a family in um, giving to God. Absolutely. We are right in the middle of our sermon series called Awe and Wonder. And one of the best ways that we know how to stand in the awe and wonder of God is to hear stories of how he's changed people's life. And so I am so excited for you today to hear a story about the power of God taking someone from death to life. So if you would, turn your attention to the screen, watch this video. My name is Gary Allen. I've been addicted to drugs and alcohol the majority of my life. I've spent almost 11 years in prison. God has radically transformed my life, and this is my story. I was born in uh, Ada, Oklahoma in 1984. My dad was what you would call maybe a disturbed Vietnam vet. My mom partied. We would go to um, Church of Christ, but I had this weird perception that they party all night, fight. Saturday night and then Sunday we get up and act like nothing's wrong and go to church. I ended up in Tulsa, North Tulsa. It was kind of a bad area. It kind of conditioned me to become a certain way. And when I was probably 12 and 13, I really started partying. And that's when I got introduced to meth. I started hanging out with my dad again when I was 15 and we started doing drugs together. And then he overdosed when I was 17. That's a period in my life where I can remember everything changing. I had to have something every day I woke up, I had to change the way I felt. In 2008, I came back to Tulsa to live with my brother. That's where I first started engaging in like criminal burglaries and stuff and I got arrested and I actually got out and then I did another one and got arrested again. I was at a maximum security prison. I seen somebody get hurt real bad. And I remember just this moment where I asked God if he would let me get away from there, I would change my life. And it was pretty wild, like I had a real cool experience. For the next probably four or five calendar years I did in prison, I could serve God in there and I could like have a relationship with him and I could be honest. I got out of prison that time. I think I made it four or five months. I started using again, went on the run and got arrested. But I was okay because you know, my family's happy when I go to jail because I was alive and I could stay sober in there. The whole time I would think, okay, how can I survive outside of here? So I read the Bible as much as I could. I read any self-help books. I worked out, I tried everything I could, and I got out and I did it again. I made it maybe six months, caught another case, went back to prison. And the third time I was in prison, I was just angry because I knew God 
had a calling on my life when I first experienced him. I knew that I wasn't meant to stay in prison forever. I was meant to live a life out here. After I got out of prison the third time, I relocated to Miami, Oklahoma. I went to a treatment center. I graduated, and for the first time, I had all the things in my life that I thought would make me okay. I had assets, I had money, I had a house, I had a, a girl, I had all these things. My brain always told me, if you could just get that, Gary, you would be okay, and I wasn't. There's a meeting place in Tulsa called Anonymity. I'd been to a thousand meetings there before, but I'd never been to this 530 ODAT meeting. And this guy said, you wanna go to a meeting? Last minute, I went. Josh Robinson and Chad Burdett were there, and I'd been in prison with Josh, and we worked in the church together. And he said, come to Oklahoma City. God put you here for a reason right now to come with us. I was like, okay. <laughs> I didn't have anything, and he said, I didn't ask you what you have. Just come, come with us. So we left, and I just followed these guys around that were ahead of me in this sobriety thing, and after Jesus, too, and, you know, that's how I got involved in AA, and I realized that, like, Wow, it was all about Jesus the whole time. It's just about blocking all that stuff from my past away where I could experience him. Started working with Brian and Chelsea Vitale at Vantage Point. Chelsea pretty much was like, look, you don't have to go back to them same people. You could come. We could be your people. You know, just come to this church, experience this. And um, I came, and it was just, you know, I've been coming here ever since. Chelsea used to always get on my bumper. She'd be like, now, now that you come to church, are you going to get involved? Are you going to help? And I'm like, why are you bothering me all the time? You know, like... But I did. I got involved. I started working on the serve team. This is the first time in my life, too, that I put God first. I didn't go get in a relationship immediately. I did a lot of stuff different than I'd always done before, and I haven't done it perfect at all. I've messed some stuff up, but the whole time I've tried to keep my eyes on God, you know, and um, it's been almost two years now, and it's just wild. Now I'm giving people rides. Now I sponsor people. Now I'm helping guys get to meetings, and I have an awesome wife that loves me. And this sounds kind of harsh, but she, you know, she's not afraid of me. She's not, I'm not that guy no more. Like, and it's crazy because I've always been that guy. I have a relationship based on Jesus. She loves Jesus more than she does me. That probably would have made me angry in the past, you know, like, because I was so selfish and scared and insecure. Like, it's just a prime example of like seeking God in everything. And I know that I can only love her through Him. It's such a crazy transformation because I was always, I was a, brother or the son that could never get it. They thought I was going to die, you know? And this church had a big part of it. You know, there's just a community. Like, I would come take all them weird pictures, and everybody would just say, okay, you know? Nobody ever told me no. And I don't know. I think that was a lot of it, just being accepted and finding out that I could be an asset, not a liability. I can help. I know we're made to connect, you know? Coming here and going through Alpha and just coming to the events at church, and not just church, but connecting with the people. And I think this church was so good about that, like just accepting me, and I'm not any different than anybody else, you know? Like, we've all been saved by grace. I always had this thing in my head before that I still, well, if they find out about me, you know? Like, when we're in the middle of a community, though, it makes it easier, because we have people around us. That's what, you know, bearing each other's burdens, laughing with each other, um, experiencing life together. He's always been there. Like, you know, I should have been dead a long time ago. I, I should probably be in prison forever. Now knowing that he's never left my side, I don't know, it's just awesome to be able to experience that, to like really know I have a father, because that was my problem the whole time. I never, never had a father. And he's always got work for me to do, you know, but he wants me to do it through him. And I think this is the biggest thing, is learning to channel everything through him. I was always so broken and I was all these things. So now my life now, I know it wasn't me. <laughs> It's changed so much that there's no doubt in my mind that it's God. How many know that God can do anything? Like really, like Jesus changes everything about everything. No life is too far gone. No situation is out of reach. No addiction has more power than God. We're watching Gary's story, and it's inspiring. And here's what I know is not everybody has that story. Not everybody, you know, has something like that. But here's what I do know is that everybody's story in here matters. Everybody's story in here is, is something that God wants to, he wants to intersect your story and meet you right where you, right where you are. Everybody has pain. Everybody has ups, downs. Everyone has disappointments and failures. Every one of us, we've all felt lost or angry or perhaps lonely or tired. Anybody ever feel tired? Right? And we're like, Lord, this is never going to change. Here's what I want to say today. Never say never. God is the God of the impossible. God is the God of doing what's never been done. Resurrection power is a power 
that saves lives that are too far gone, marriages that are at the end of their rope, people that are lost in despair and depression. It is the power to reach people who are angry, who are full of doubts, and who are even done with God. Resurrection power is the power that says things that will never happen. It looks at that tomb and says, come out of that grave and live again. God wants you to hear that today. He wants you to live. He wants to give you life. He wants to breathe life. Does anyone believe that God can do anything? Amen? Amen. All right, my friends. Well, I'm glad you're here. I'm so thankful you're here. In fact, look at your neighbor right now and just say, I'm so glad you're here. Look at your other neighbor and say, I'm glad you're here too. If you are a guest or you are new here or you got invited today, we are so thankful. If this is your church home, we are so thankful you are here. It is a special day. My name's Tim. If we don't know each other, I'm the pastor here. And as a church, we have been praying for today. We have been praying. We are in the middle of what we call 10 days of prayer, or we've been calling it this year the 10 days of awe. And we have hundreds of people coming together, and we are uniting in prayer, believing that God wants to do something. We're not just praying for today. We're praying for just God to do a work in our city and in our lives and in this church. And we've been praying for the day, though. We believe God wants to breathe life today. And one more little bit of fun today that I'd like to have, a little bit of a tradition, so to speak, is there is a greeting that Christians have said to one another for 2,000 years on Easter Sunday. One believer would say, he is risen. The other one would say, he is risen indeed. You guys ever heard this? Yeah, yeah we're going to do it today. And I'm going to say he is, Christ is risen, and then you're going to shout back at me with everything you got. He is risen indeed. You all ready to do this? If you're new here, welcome. <laughs> Jump right in with this. Ready? Here we go. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Oh, I love it. Yes. Today we declare that a resurrection took place. Amen. He is not dead. Amen. He is risen. And if this story of resurrection, here's the thing. If we believe it, right, it changes everything about everything. Because here's the thing. Here's the thing. Jesus was no longer maybe the Messiah. Jesus was no longer maybe the Son of God. Jesus is either the biggest hoax ever played on humanity or he is exactly who he said he was. That's what we believe. We are in a series of messages called Awe and Wonder. Everyone say Awe and Wonder. And this is our theme today. That this is our focus, that are we a person that lives our life in the awe of God, in the wonder of his goodness and his power and the possibility of what he could do? And I don't want you to just quickly say, of course, I'm a person that is, lives in the awe and wonder of God. Of course I am. You know, our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above. Like that, not that, let's not do that quite yet. I don't want us to blindly agree today. I want you to consider for yourself what does it mean to live in the awe and wonder of God? A lot of us know the feeling of being in awe of something. We can be in awe of people, right? We might say, oh, man, I am in awe of who you are. Or we look at someone's skill or talent. We say, oh, they are amazing. They are awesome, right? Or maybe you've been awestruck. Have you ever ran into someone or see someone famous or a celebrity unexpectedly? You ever had that moment? I, a couple weeks ago, I was actually standing right out here on the street, right in front of the church. And... I was talking to a friend, and up pulls an SUV, and out of that SUV steps Jimmy Butler, a.k.a. Jimmy Buckets. If you don't know who that is, he's one of my favorite NBA players who plays for the Miami Heat. And I start, I, I'm with a friend, and I start, I start hitting his arm, and I start saying, oh, my gosh, Jimmy Butler, Jimmy Butler, Jimmy Butler. Guys, I am a 40-something-year-old man. 40-something. I'm not telling you exactly how many. 40-something. And I started slapping him like I'm a fangirl at a Jonas Brothers concert. You know what I mean? Like, we get awestruck in life. I've been awestruck of people and what they do in sports and fields of science and the things that they accomplish or people who write or people who speak or entrepreneurs and leaders. We get, we, we, we can say, we get in awe of people, don't we? We have also been in awe several times of, you know, when we witness something in creation that just makes your jaw drop. You know what I mean? Like, if you've ever been to Yosemite National Park, there are so many places that will leave you speechless. And I was hiking there a few years ago, and Ryan Moore, you all know Ryan, he plays the drums, he's our alpha director. Well, we get to the summit of this epic hike, and, and he's, he literally gets to this, to, this, to this view, it opens up, and he starts crying, like boo-hooing, putting his hands on his head. And here's the deal, Ryan's a crier, but in this moment, in this moment, it's totally, totally made sense. It's, it was an awestruck moment. 
Creation is an endless buffet. It's such an endless buffet, you pronounce it buffet. It's an endless buffet of awe and wonder, right? We should be walking through life with awe and wonder of all that God has made. The endless, endless miracles that no one can explain how or why, but we get to enjoy it nonetheless. So we all have the experience of being in the awe of God. But let's talk about the wonder. What about the wonder? Living in the wonder of God is being caught up in the power and possibility of what God could do. A lot of us move from that first definition, though, of what wonder could be, and we move to the second that's more like we start to wonder about God. We wonder if God. We wonder, is God real? We wonder, does God care? So wonder moves from imagining possibilities to questioning what is possible and plausible, just like that. Anyone know what I'm talking about? So today we're going to talk about the wonder of God versus the wonder if God. And I want to get into this by inviting you to imagine, if you will, the very first Easter Sunday. So I literally let your mind imagine the scene, like, almost like a movie playing in your mind today. And let's begin on the scene that Sunday with the disciples of Jesus. The scriptures say that they are locked behind doors because they are afraid of the Jews. So I want you to imagine this scene, a large group of 20, 30, maybe 40 disciples gathered together in a home somewhere in Jerusalem. And they've been huddled up for the last few days and they are afraid They are afraid, and I totally get it. I mean, don't you? Like, it makes sense. Just days earlier, the Jewish leaders had leveraged their power to have Jesus crucified. And and they had finally killed Jesus. The disciples were yet to fully understand that no one took the life of Jesus. He willingly gave it. Anybody agree with that? That theology had not yet formed They didn't quite get that yet. Three days after the resurrection, it felt as if his life had been taken. So imagine this group of disciples. They are friends. They are close. And they are in mourning. They are afraid. And they are thinking, you know, I've given my life to this. Now what? You talk about wondering. They are wondering, what am I going to do? What's next? Was it worth it? It was like the rug of their life had been pulled out from underneath them. And now they are laying on the floor unsure what to do. Anybody ever had that happen in life? Where you get knocked down and you don't know how to get back up. Life will do that. Losing a job. Losing a marriage. Getting a diagnosis. The death of a loved one. Hitting rock bottom. Feeling rejected. Failing at something you thought you'd never fail at. This is where the disciples were. They are knocked down. But this is the third day. And it started early that day. Again, we're imagining this, right? It started early that day. Some disciples had went to the tomb And they found that it was empty. So now Peter and John are back. And they are frantically telling everyone, Jesus is gone. The tomb is empty. And Mary Magdalene is saying, Jesus is not just gone. Jesus is alive. I saw him. So this room is on edge. And in fact, the whole city, the whole city of Jerusalem is on edge. Everything is in chaos. Now it's Passover weekend. So the city is overrun with guests, people that have been traveling in. But I want you to think about what all these people had seen or heard in just the last few days. Firsthand, they had seen or heard that the religious leaders had demanded the death of Jesus, this man who had claimed to be the Messiah. Now, no matter what side of that argument you you are on, thinking that your Jewish leaders would have a person killed at the hands of the Romans, I mean, that's messed up. It was a Jewish holy day, and you're thinking, man... That, that's already got to be a lot for you to swallow. And they subjected him to the worst kind of death, Roman crucifixion. I mean, it doesn't get much worse than that. And they hung him on a cross. And while Jesus was hanging on the cross, God began to do a life, world-changing work. And people were unaware of what was actually happening. The scriptures say that the whole sky turned a dreadful black in the middle of the day. Can you imagine? All the lights went out. And the people... In the city, they didn't know what was happening. They weren't associating it with Jesus hanging on the cross. They thought some wild phenomenon was happening. Everything goes out. All the lights go out. Everything's black, middle of the day. And then it says right after that, it's followed by a violent earthquake. So violent that it shook 
The entire city, the temple was, the, the rocks of the temple split. It says that the veil in the temple was torn in two. Then it says that even many of the tombs in the city or around the city, they broke open and people who were dead were raised back to life and walked out. <laughs> Jerusalem was losing their mind. Like, what is happening? That Friday afternoon, the Roman governor, Pilate, he allows Jesus to be buried in a tomb and put under Roman guard. I've always thought that was wait, weird. Why are you guarding a dead man? Unless you think he might not stay dead. So then, early on Sunday morning, another earthquake happens. And the guards are so terrified by what they see. It says, the scriptures say that some angels came down and descended upon the tomb. And it says that they became like dead men. They were, they were scared to death. Now an empty tomb exists of a man who claimed to be the Messiah. Where prophecies had existed prior to his existence. And announcing this very thing would happen, that he'd be resurrected after three days. So Jerusalem is on edge. So let's get back to this scene where the disciples are gathered in a home behind locked doors. John 20, verse 19, let's get it. Later that on that day, the disciples, so that day is Easter Sunday. Back then it was just Sunday. Later on that day, the disciples had gathered together, but fearful of the Jews, had locked the doors in the house. Jesus entered and stood among them. So the disciples are already freaked out, and then all of a sudden, Jesus appears. Now, a lot of theologians, they don't really know what happened, but they don't believe that the door got open for him. He just shows up. I don't know if he walked through the wall. He just appears. I thought, well, maybe it's more practical. Maybe he had a key, and it was underneath the pot outside, and he knew where the hidden key was. I don't know. Nonetheless, he stands among them, and it says this, peace to you. Then he showed him his hands and his side. The disciples, seeing the master with their own eyes, were, uh-oh, awestruck. Everyone say awestruck. awestruck. There it is. They were in awe. What is happening? Never say never, right? Jesus repeated his greeting, peace to you. Just as the Father sent me, I send you. Then he took a deep breath and breathed into them. Receive the Holy Spirit, he said. If you forgive someone's sins, they're gone for good. If you don't forgive them, what are you going to do with them? So he breathes on them. He says, receive the Holy Spirit. He says, essentially, he's saying, receive my forgiveness. And I also want you to give this forgiveness to others. It's almost like Jesus took the disciples back to when God created man in Genesis. You remember when God created man, he breathed into the dirt man, the breath of life, and he became a living being. Now God, through Jesus, once again, after death, is breathing into his disciples who are knocked down. He says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and lift you back up. I'm going to breathe life into you. So he breathes into them. And now the statement, he says, is peace be with you. Now that's an announcement of God's fulfillment and his completion. In Hebrew, it would have been shalom alechayim. <laughs> shalom alechayim. Now, this isn't a statement of, hey, you know, hey, don't be afraid. I'm here, peace, like peace, you know, I'm here. I come in peace. He says, no, no, no. It's something different. He says, I come, and I'm bringing something to completion. Now, in our minds, when we hear the word peace, shalom, peace, when we hear peace, we think the absence of something. We think, oh, peace, the absence of war, or peace, the absence of noise, so peace and quiet, or peace, the absence of, of, of stress or anxiety. I need peace over my life. But in our world, peace is, yeah, the absence of something. But in the kingdom, in the kingdom, peace is the presence of someone. It's fulfillment. It's completion. So when Jesus says peace with you, he's announcing God's presence with them. The story of the gospel, the story of the cross, the story of the resurrection, it's about God's presence in the world and in the midst. When we're, oh, the, the city's on edge. The city's on chaos. It's God's presence in the midst of fear, confusion, chaos, destruction. God's saying, I'm here. I'm bringing something new. Then in verse 24... It says, but Thomas, sometimes called the twin, any twins in the house? <laughs> People just ever call you twin? They can't tell you apart, so they say, hey, twin. That's what's going on here. Thomas has a little known twin brother named Fromis, so it's Thomas and Fromis. I just made that up. That's not true. Sorry, we'll start over. But Thomas, sometimes called the twin, one of the 12 was not with them when Jesus came. 
The other disciples told him, we saw the master. But he said, unless I see the nail holes in his hands, put my finger in the nail holes, and stick my hand in his side, I won't believe it. So Thomas says, yeah, like, yeah, I don't think so. So the awe of the disciples became the wonder of Thomas. Meaning, I want you to think about this. He's like, I, he's wondering what they ate for breakfast. He's like, he's wondering, are you guys okay? He's wondering, were there mushrooms in your salad at lunch? Are you hallucinating? <laughs> he is not in the wonder of Jesus. He is in the wonder if Jesus. Thomas gets a bad rap for this moment. We even got a name for poor Thomas, don't we, in the church. What do we call him? Yeah. Doubting Thomas. Man, before this moment, he was just called twin. He's like, can I have that name back? Since this moment, we call him Doubting Thomas, and I'm not sure that's fair. I mean, if there was, I mean, he was struggling to believe in a resurrection if there ever was a reasonable doubt. I mean, have you ever been the doubter yourself? You know, maybe, someone, maybe everybody in the whole room has a great plan, and you're like, that plan is not going to work. <laughs> I mean, I could have told you many, many years ago that waterbeds were not a good idea. <laughs> but, but in the 80s, you weren't anybody unless you had a waterbed. I sat down on it one time, and I was like, mm-mm. This ain't going to work. This is not going to last. This, I was a doubter. You ever been the doubter when everyone else is all in? With faith, with God, meaning everybody in the room is like buying in on like everything the Bible says and everything that pastor says. Can I just tell you, you don't have to be on, in on everything I say. You don't. You don't have to. I mean, I just called Thomas's twin brother from us. I'm an idiot. <laughs> well, we give Thomas the worst treatment, doubting Thomas. As if we're forgetting he was an apostle of Jesus who would eventually give his life for his faith. Listen, he doubted the most impossible thing ever. We should be okay with that. Instead of doubting Thomas, how about we call him like keeping it real Thomas? <laughs> Truthful Thomas. How about twinning Thomas? I'm good with that one. Because I, I was there, I would be like with Thomas, I'd be like twinning. Because <laughs> I'd be saying the same thing. If I was gone... When Jesus showed up, and I did like Thomas did, and I show back up, and they're like, oh, man, you just missed it. Jesus was here. I would be like, are you okay? Come over here. I need to take your temperature. <laughs> By the way, where was Thomas? Why was he missing? That's what we should be calling him out on. <laughs> was he late, like tardy Thomas? <laughs> Maybe he's getting, he was getting food for the crew, Grubhub Thomas. I don't know what we should call him. But doubting Thomas is not fair. I'm here to say that today. I believe it's natural to have doubts. In fact, faith is predicated by doubt. Faith and doubt are always connected. Faith begins with questions and doubts. Faith begins with wondering if. I mean, without doubt, it's typically just facts. We don't wonder about the things that are facts that are just true. For example, it doesn't require faith to believe that eating will nourish my body. Now, I can't see it, but I know that science has proven that nutrition comes from food being eaten, eaten, going into my body, my stomach and intestines, taking the food, the nutrients, the vitamins, minerals, building up my cells and my organs. Here's the thing. I don't have to take a step of faith to believe that my next meal will give me life. That's a fact. Eat and live. But it does require faith to believe that my body is a miracle, that it's only by divine design that our bodies work the way they do, and that they so perfectly break down that food that I may live. It takes faith to believe that I am God-made, not self-made, not man-made, not accidentally made by a big bang. No, no, it takes faith to believe that I am God-made. Science does an amazing job of telling us how things work, but it, had, it, it, and it, it just does not do an adequate job, if you will, of explaining why it works and most things, it doesn't even tell us how it even came to be. Many scientists acknowledge this. They say there is an end of facts and a beginning of mystery. And some scientists would even say, and that mystery is only explained by God. So science and God aren't enemies. In fact, science and God are very much friends. I mean, God is a scientist after all. He created it. Science and faith work together. We discover facts, and then we live in faith. Some of us, though, we only prefer to deal in facts. 
The problem with that is that the world and God designed life to be intentional in a way that leaves room for wonder to exist in order to faith to be discovered. Think about it this way. For love to exist, a choice must exist. For God to love us, he had to choose us. For you to love God, you had to choose God. Love is in a fact, it's a choice. Faith is in a fact, it's a choice. I choose to believe. Thomas, what did he say? He said, hey, unless I see the nail holes in his hands and put my finger in the nail holes and stick my hand in his side, I will not believe it. He's like, listen, it's not like I will never believe, but I won't believe until I, until I have some evidence, until I see him for myself. So we can say it this way. I choose to believe based upon evidence. Thomas wanted evidence. Now, evidence is actually a good thing. Lots of us need evidence to believe in things. So I'm not just talking to people who are struggling to believe in God. I'm talking to everyone in the room. We all have doubts when it comes to our faith. And we would like to see evidence in order to help us believe. For example, when my son Grayson says he's done his chores, oftentimes I'll say, I need to see this for myself. I need evidence. (laughs) I know for me and my faith in Christ, I have lots of evidence in my experience that tells me that God is not only real, but that God loves me and that he loves all people. For example, I see the big, obvious, general evidence through creation. A lot of us have to acknowledge this. I I, I see stuff and think only God could do that. Only God could make that ocean, could hang those stars, could carve that canyon, could paint that flower, could create those seasons. I also find evidence in the Bible, right? We have loads of historical evidence validating much of the Bible. The, The crucifixion and the resurrection itself are some of the most validated, verified stories of ancient history. I also find evidence through my experiences in life. I have a lot of experiences where I've, 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 I've went through something and I thought that can only be explained by God. For example, my wife, she, her feet were healed a number of years ago, uh, supernaturally and instantly after a time of prayer ministry where she had been dealing with lots of pain over years. So she experienced it personally and felt it. I witnessed it uh, personally through an up-close encounter witnessing what God had done. And I've also seen people healed in a lot of different times of prayer. I've been a part of that, seen it, experienced even some measures of it in my own life. And I see him not only heal, but I've seen him provide for people, and I've seen him do things that can only be explained by God. Those are my personal experiences. Some of you have personal experiences, which you're like, you can only explain it by God. Even the teachings of Jesus himself are evidence, right? Uh, Think about the teachings of Jesus. Here they are, they happened 2,000 years ago, and the world cannot improve on them. They are literally the greatest teachings about life ever uttered into the world. It's as if God said them himself. Blind faith in something without any evidence is not what the Bible says to do. We're like, what? Blind faith. He's not asking for blind faith. It's important for you to hear that God is not asking for you to blindly believe. God has always given you signs and wonders in order to help you believe. People have this perception of Christianity and the church, that it should be buttoned up in a perfect place where you don't ask questions and you don't ever wonder why. Unfortunately, some churches and Christians have been that way, and they punish people who do have questions and who do wonder. The Bible actually invites us to explore, to ask questions, and even to doubt. If you were going to search through the Psalms and the book of Job and Ecclesiastes, and then you see the example of Nicodemus in the book of John, these are all great examples of times when questions and doubts are presented in the Bible. And so I want you to think about it. God created a book, and it includes people who have questions and who have doubts. I think God can handle our questions. But in every case, God eventually asks, I've shown you something. Now, will you choose to believe? If you have faith questions, the healthy way to walk with them, and this is what I've seen people do, where they weight their questions so severely, they improperly weight them and they cancel out, They cancel out the clear evidences of God in their life. For example, we often want to dismiss modern-day experiences, modern-day miracle stories, such as healing or God providing in some miraculous way, because we maybe doubt the validity of the story or because we don't understand it or there's no factual explanation or we think coincidence or, or we wonder why some are healed and others aren't. But when we dismiss modern-day miracles, it's like dismissing or stripping the portfolio of an artist who's completed 10,000 masterpieces 
And then we say to them, I don't care what you've already done. I just want to know if you can paint my house. We can't dismiss the work of the artist. When we do, we reduce the honor due him, and we turn him into a laborer instead of an artist. Listen to me. God is not here to work on your behalf. God is an artist whose intent is to open your eyes to the awe and wonder of life. That was very good. You should have said amen. God is giving us evidence, but we have to be willing to acknowledge his signs and wonders. Philip Yancey, an author of many books on faith, writes extensively on the subject of doubt. He says, inquisitiveness and questioning are inevitable parts of life and faith. Where there is certainty, there is no room for faith. It doesn't help simply to deny doubts or feel guilty about them. Many people, after all, have been down that path before and have emerged with a strong faith. See, I'm an advocate of actually exploring questions and doubts because even when I think about my own salvation, my own relationship with Christ, doubt is actually what drove me to find stability and peace in my heart. Listen, to be clear, I'm not celebrating doubt today. I'm not saying, you know, doubt is the goal. I'm not hoping to increase your doubt quotient today. I certainly want you to feel confidence and peace in your life. I certainly hope that you would say, I used to doubt if God cared for me, but now I know that God cares for me. I want faith to rise up in you today. I'm simply saying this. I'm simply saying you are safe here. Your doubts don't disqualify you. In fact, your doubts may be the very thing that God uses to deliver you. You are safe to ask questions. And hear this. You are allowed to be a faithful follower of Jesus who wonders about things. You are, you are allowed to be a faithful follower of Jesus who wonders about things. I actually hope that sets someone free. Maybe you're thinking, Tim, man, you're opening the door to doubt. Isn't that dangerous? No, no, no. I'm opening the door to faith. I'm opening the door to faith. Every doubt will require faith to step over that fear or that doubt and to choose to believe. Even when there's a lack of certainty. So what happens to Thomas? We've got to finish the story. John 20, verse 26. Eight days later, so a week later, his disciples were again in the room. This time Thomas was with them. Dude, aren't you proud of him? He's growing. He showed up on time, on time Thomas. <laughs> Jesus came through the locked doors. Again, Jesus just shows up freaking everybody out. Or he's got a key. He stood among them and said, Peace to you. Same declaration. Shalom Alehaim. Then he focused his attention on Thomas. He says, take your finger and examine my hands. Take your hand and stick it in my side. Don't be unbelieving. Believe. Thomas said, my master, my God. Jesus said, so you believe because you've seen me with your own eyes? Even better blessings for those. Or, 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 bless, let me say that again. Even better blessings are in store for those who believe without seeing. This is actually an incredible moment. Jesus comes to Thomas, meets him where he is, and does exactly for him what Thomas asked for. He's not like proving it or sticking it in his face. He's like, God sees you. Sometimes we're like, God, I need you to do this. And guess what? He shows up and does exactly what you need. He shows up to Thomas and says, I see you, Thomas. I care for you. Go ahead. See the, see the holes in my hands. See, see the scars. In my, I mean, the hole in my side. Put your hand there. That's grace. That's love. Thomas said, I'll only believe if. And Jesus said, I got you, Thomas. Now listen to the last part of the chapter. The very next verse, the Apostle John writes this. He sums this whole thing up. Jesus provided far more God-revealing signs. Signs are evidence. He provided a lot more signs than are written down in this book. These are written down so that you will believe. Everyone say believe. That Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and in the act of believing, have real and eternal life in the way that he personally revealed it. He is saying, listen, Jesus revealed to you how to live life. And he's like, that's the purpose of why I wrote this all down. He's like, I tried to give you enough evidence and enough testimony. He's like, listen, way more happened than I even wrote down. He said, this ride with Jesus has been nonstop and wild, but I gave you as much as I could in order that you might believe. Today, let me ask you, are you living more in the wonder if than the wonder of God? Jesus comes for those who wonder if 
he's truly alive. Jesus comes for those who wonder if he really cares. He comes for those who wonder if you matter. He comes for those who wonder if you'll ever get better. He wonders, or if you wonder if, if you'll ever be free. For those who wonder if God exists, Jesus comes to you like he did to Thomas. And he says, peace be to you. Shalom Alehaim. I am here. Fulfillment, completion. Then he says, believe. Jesus clearly commanded Thomas to stop his unbelief and to start believing. Jesus was generous and merciful to Thomas, met him exactly where he was in his unbelief. And Jesus did not praise the unbelief. He was understanding, but he wanted to move him from doubt to faith. Jesus doesn't leave you to doubt and to wander forever. He gives you what you need in order to help you believe. By faith, I want you to hear me, by faith, by faith, faith is always a choice. Faith isn't solely rooted in facts. There will always be mystery. There will always be something we don't quite understand, but we still have the faith to choose to believe. It'll never be like this sweater is black and those curtains are red. God can never be test tube, or <laughs> God can never be proved in a test tube or in a textbook. Especially for us. Thomas had the privilege of seeing with his eyes the resurrected Jesus. But what did he say? He said, he said, even better blessings are in store for those who believe without seeing. The Lord blesses us when we believe in Jesus without seeing him, like the disciples got to see him. He gives us evidence, but he also leaves room for faith because faith is a choice. It's choosing to believe that Jesus is who he said he was and he is worthy of following all the days of your life. So many of us, and I want you to hear this because I've thought about this message and I thought, you know, this is going to sound like someone who's maybe a skeptic of God, a skeptic of God and, and I'm trying to prove his existence. That's not what this is about. This is about every person in the room struggling to have more faith. It's a choice to believe that he's going to show up for you, that he's going to help you and your family, that the more you follow him, the more life he will give you. The more you make of Jesus, the more you make, he will make of you. It's a, it's a choice. It's a faith to believe that the more I pray, the more he listens. It's, a, it's faith to believe that life is more than what you've made it to be, that he has more for you. This isn't just for the skeptic. This is for the believer in here who lets doubts store up in them like a dam in their heart. So many of us have allowed doubts and fears to be like a dam that, that stops the river of God flowing freely in your life. You've stopped short of what God has promised. And so when we need more faith, when I say that, I'm not just talking to the skeptic. I'm talking to the believer who has, who has calculated their faith to just enough to feel like they have eternal security in heaven. We need more. This world needs more. Your life needs more. Your family needs more. We need more faith. We can't just rely on facts. We got to believe that God wants to do more in our life. Doubting Thomas was a believer, but yet he needed more faith. We look for certainty. But where there is certainty, there is no room for faith. There's an amazing story from the life of Mother Teresa. When a brilliant ethicist, his name was John Cavanaugh, he, he went to work at the House of the Dying in Calcutta, which is where the place of uh, Mother Teresa's ministry was. It was sort of a pilgrimage for him. He wanted to go there and he wanted to kind of seek out questions about what was next in his life, what he should give the rest of his life to. And on the very first morning that he was there, he actually got to meet Mother Teresa. And she said, hey, what can I do for you? And Cavanaugh replied and said, will you pray for me? Well, I mean, if you want someone to pray for you, Mother Teresa's a pretty good one. She says, well, what do you want me to pray for? And he asked for what many of us have prayed for our whole life. He said, pray that I have clarity. I need clarity. And she firmly said, no, I will not pray for that. And when he asked her why, she said, clarity is the last thing you are clinging to, and you must let go of it. Then Kavanaugh commented, well, you've always seemed to have the clarity and I long for the kind of clarity you have. And she laughed and said, I have never had clarity. What I have always had is trust. 
I will pray that you trust God. Then Kavanaugh walked away changed, right? If you are wanting clarity or certainty today, know God actually is trying to build something differently in you. He builds believers who trust, believe, and have faith without seeing. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So I do want to ask you again, how is God speaking to you today? Because I believe this message is for everyone in the room. Let faith rise up. God can do anything. Awe and wonder. You may have been in church for years and have struggled with doubts. You may be new to church and maybe your whole problem with the idea of church, the idea of God has been doubts. Is this real? Well, the resurrection is the dividing line. He says this in his word. He says, if you believe that Jesus is Lord and confess with your mouth that he is Lord, and you believe that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. God is always inviting us to step over our fears and our doubts into belief. He extends great mercy to us, great kindness to us, great patience with us. How many of you are thankful for God's patience today? He invites all. I, one of the other things that has struck me recently is just how inviting our God is. He invites all of us into his kingdom. He says that he comes and he knocks at the door of our heart. Like he literally comes to each and every one of us and he knocks. And how is he knocking? He, by showing us evidence. By showing us his creation, by showing us the things that he does in our life that no one else could do. It had to be God. Amen. He knocks on our heart and says, can I come in? Amen. And some of us, it's time to let him in. It's time to choose to believe. I want to pray over us. Will you uh, bow your heads? And I just want to encourage you to just consider how is God speaking to you today? Encourage you to consider how do you need to open your heart up wider to him today? So come, Holy Spirit, I pray that as we take these next few moments, Father, to just reflect on what you're doing in our heart, Lord, would you help us right now? Would you help us? God, we want to trust in you. We want to believe. We want to walk in awe and wonder right now, Father. I actually want to encourage you, every head bow, just start paying attention. God is going to prompt many of you this morning to take a step of faith over doubt, over fear, over wondering. I believe there's actually many in here today that God is wanting you to step towards to him in a way that's stepping back to him, to recommit your life to him. Meaning you're already a believer, you've surrendered your life to Jesus, and today you're realizing you've allowed doubt or questions or circumstances in life or people's opinions about things to be a hindrance They've worked like a dam in your heart, and you are ready for God to flow, flow freely in you again. And if that's where you're at today, I just want to ask you, do you need to recommit to him? Is that what he's saying to you? I also believe there's someone here today. Today is going to be your day of salvation. God has you here today. He knows you're here. He, he knows everything about you. He knew you'd be here today. And this is the moment that you can choose to take the step of faith. The moment you put your full trust in God. No more trying to cling to certainty or facts, but you are going to take step of faith believing that he's giving you all you need to put your trust in him. Every person is invited into God's family. Every person is loved by God. But every person also has to come to the realization that they need to be rescued by God from a life of sin. And it takes faith to believe that, that God can save you. You can't do it on your own. You have to choose to believe. I already told you, the Bible says that God comes, Jesus comes and knocks on the door of everyone's heart and asks, can I come in? The Bible says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The Bible says no one comes to the Father except through Jesus. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. In other words, don't be unbelieving, but believe. So if you're ready today to trust God, to put your life in the hands of Jesus, if you're ready to surrender your life to God, I just want to lead you in a prayer. And a 
I say this often, but I, I just believe it's important because maybe this is your first time here to hear it. It's that you can give your life to Christ in a lot of different ways, a lot of different moments, a lot of different places. It's all about this. It's all about surrendering your life to him and saying, God, I can't do life without you. I want you to be the Lord and the leader of my life. But moments like this at the end of a church service have, have, have been a way that many people have given their life to Christ. It's the way I gave my life to Christ. And I want to offer that invitation to you today. It's an invitation to come into God's family, to enter into his kingdom. And if you want to do that today, if you want to accept God's invitation and his gift of salvation, just pray this prayer. Repeat it. I'll help you. Just say, Jesus, I give you my life. Just say that prayer. Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, just whisper it right where you're at. Jesus, I give you my life. Taking a step over fear today, over doubt today. One more time. Jesus, I give you my life. Now repeat the rest of this prayer. I ask for forgiveness of my sins. I confess you are Lord. Please come and fill me with your spirit. Thank you, God, for saving me. If you just prayed that prayer, everybody's heads bowed. Just, just for a moment, one more step of faith today, a step of courage that I want to ask you to do because I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. If you just prayed that prayer and it was something that you meant, and if you just take one more step of faith just by lifting your hand today so I can say a prayer for you, just lift your hand up wherever you're at. That's good. I see you over there. Yep, yep, I, I see you. Thank you. Several hands. Praise God. I'm going to pray for you in just a moment, but I want to make one more invitation. If you are already a believer, but you felt distance from God and you're ready to come back to him today, perhaps you're feeling led to say, God, I, I want to recommit to you today. I just want to say to you, life happens, stuff happens, we drift, but God always says, you're welcome home. God can restore to you the joy of your salvation. God can be your number one again. But it starts with the moment which you say, God, I'm coming back. I'm recommitting. And if you want to do that today, you can just pray this prayer. Just repeat this prayer if you're ready to recommit your life to Jesus. Just say, Lord, restore me. Lord, restore me. Forgive me for drifting away. Fill me with awe and wonder. Renew my heart today. I recommit my life to you. And in the same way, I want to pray for you. If you would just be bold enough to just say, hey, I just prayed that, and I'm, I'm recommitting my life today. Would you just lift your hand where you're at real quick? I'm going to pray over you as well. Thank you. I see you. A whole bunch of hands. Thank you, Jesus. Love it. If you just prayed either one of those prayers, I'm praying for you right now. Father, thank you. Thank you for how you bring life. Thank you for how you breathe life. It's, it's, it's that moment. Jesus is breathing life. And we thank you. Seal these moments of salvation and recommitment, Father. May the enemy not snatch them away, but that you protect this moment. And that may you, may you begin a new work and a new life in each and every person that raised their hand today. We pray these things in your name. And everybody said, amen. Can we celebrate God today? He's so good. Why don't you stand with us? Stand up. Stand up. Everybody stand up. We're going to worship today. We're not done. We're going to just worship. And if you prayed those prayers, I will give you some more instruction in just a moment. But we're going to first, we're going to worship. And this altar is a place, a place of reconciliation and recommitment and renewal. If you want to come and give God praise today, you can. We have a prayer team that will be here to pray with you for needs in your life. Don't leave today. Don't leave today without responding to what God is saying. So let's stay locked in for just a few more minutes and let's just worship together, pray together, respond to the risen Jesus.
celebrate God today one more time. Come on. He's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our thanks. He's so good. We are so grateful that you have joined us today. If you prayed to receive Christ today, if you prayed that Jesus, I give you my life prayer, we'd love to meet you. Please come up here and just share with one, someone on our prayer team, hey, I, I prayed that prayer today, and we'd love to chat with you, talk with you, get to know you, help you in these next few steps. Guys, thank you for joining us. We hope you have an amazing rest of your day, and whatever you're doing with family today. All the things we mentioned early in announcements, it's all out in the lobby. Uh, we have another, another service starting in about 20 minutes, so uh, make room for them. But we're so grateful you are here today, and we love you. If there's anything we can pray with you about, please let us know. We'll be right up here in the front. Guys, uh, happy Easter. Grace and peace. See you.